Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Capgemini webinar on uh, the understanding the role of customer experience in the global automotive recovery. We're very happy to have you today. We've got a great panel of presenters to talk about the global response uh, to customer experience in the face of uh, challenging situations in the automotive sector. So we're going to start this morning uh, and look at our agenda and see our panelists and the topics that they're going to cover. We're so excited to have Rick Parrish from Forrester help us understand the importance of customer experience and the role that it plays in uh, really facilitating every aspect of a customer journey um, and many times in the employee journey uh, in providing goods and services. We're lucky to have Julia Feche here this morning from China to help us understand what's going on on the ground there. Daniel Garshagen in Europe, uh, based in Munich, to help us understand from a European perspective how the market is progressing. And here in North America, Mike Dar is going to talk about what we're seeing uh, on the ground here and how CX is leading the recovery efforts. Uh, we're going to have a quick Q&A afterwards, uh, but thank you so much for joining us here this morning. So uh, earlier this year, the Capgemini Research Institute did a survey of 11,000 people across 11 countries, including Europe, China, India, and the US. And we had three distinct uh, discoveries come out of that survey um, that, that I think are going to help frame our discussion this morning. Uh, we were looking at uh, you know, what customer buyer sentiment was like what it was going to be like in the in the near term and medium term, and and what they were looking for from uh, the automotive purchase experience, and what we found uh, was that there were three areas uh, that were the the biggest um, uh, changes in sentiment. Then on on the next slide. And those, uh, those had to do with usage, uh, where we see that most people are leaning towards not uh, taking public transportation uh, and, and choosing individual mo mobility uh, solutions. Um, there, were, there were some other uh, findings that we had around um, the preferences on purchase. I think that what we saw that was the most interesting, uh, especially here in North America, was a new interest from the 35 and under demographic in actually owning a car. Uh, that, that group has more often chosen uh, ride sharing and public transportation. I think that you can see uh, from a hygiene perspective uh, that those, uh, those interests have shifted to, uh, to looking at car purchase, maybe even for the first time. So a brand new market there. And then lastly, uh, the, the channels of engagement, how people want to uh, research, uh, go through the consideration process, and then purchase and ownership has really shifted to online. And I think underpinning all three of these findings is the importance of customer experience. I'm very excited again to have Rick Parrish here this morning to talk to us about that. Mike Dar, who leads our North American Invent Automotive Practice. Julie Pesci, a consultant in our Beijing office in China. Daniel Garshagen, uh, lead of the uh, AIE in Munich and, and uh, automotive specialist. And then uh, I'll be helping uh, uh, along this morning, uh, Daniel Davenport in the North American Automotive Practice. So without further ado, I'd love to turn it over to Rick to help us understand a little bit better about the importance of CX. Great, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks for having me, everyone. It's really good to be with you uh, today. And the first thing I want to do is start out by getting us all on the same page about what customer experience actually is. Customer experience is, is simply this. It's how customers perceive their interaction with an organization. And you'll notice that this definition is entirely from the customer's perspective. You know, traditionally, a lot, of, a lot of companies want to say, hey, customer, here's what we're doing for you or with you or to you. But, uh, you know, your customers don't care what you claim to be doing for them or with them or to them. They only care about what their lived experience of dealing with you actually is. You don't get to argue with that. Believe me, I've seen companies try. 
But that's the essence of the customer of the customer experience. It's the customer's perspective. Now, the second thing to note about CX is that it's a, about the entire customer life cycle. A lot of times when uh, when companies think about a customer experiences, either they think only about marketing and they forget about the rest of the customer life cycle, or they think just about maybe the moment of the transaction and then support for the transaction. You know, when you buy the widget and when you call up and say the widget broke. But there's a whole relationship out there, a whole customer life cycle, and it's all important. And the customer experience uh, consists of the whole thing. And we want to think about the whole thing. And the third real key point here about CX is that a lot of times, traditionally, companies think that CX uh, is a, um, a sort of expensive necessity. You know, there are these things called customers out there. You got to do something for them. But let's do as little as possible because it's costing us money. But what our research actually shows, and this is cold, hard data, not wishful thinking. CX isn't a cost center. It's a force multiplier. That's just a, a, a term that means something that makes everything else work better. Right? Put another way, it's cheaper to provide a good experience than it is to provide a bad one. And if you focus on improving the quality of your customer experience, your organization will run more efficiently. Uh, next slide, please. Now, every customer experience has three dimensions, what we call the three E's of CX, effectiveness, ease, and emotion. And the first two are pretty easy. Uh, in order to be effective, an experience has to deliver the right value to customers. They need to be able to accomplish what they're trying to accomplish. And by the way, that's what they're trying to accomplish, not what you wish they were trying to accomplish. Second, ease. It can't be difficult for customers to get the value they're trying to get. And third, and most crucially, is emotion. Now, we've got a mountain of data. I'm going to say more about data in a second. But we've got a mountain of cold, hard data that shows that it doesn't matter if you're in North America or China or Europe or anywhere else. It doesn't matter if you're young or old. It doesn't matter anything. Emotion is the most important part of the customer experience. Put another way, you can create the most effective, easiest experience in the world. But unless it leaves people feeling the way they need to feel, it won't be a great customer experience. That's the most important thing to remember here. Uh, next slide, please. Now, why is CX so important? Well, it's important because it drives revenue growth. It's not just a nice thing to do for people or something that will get you good press. It's a driver of business success because when you improve CX quality, you boost customer loyalty, you boost retention loyalty. That is, do customers continue doing business with you or do they go somewhere else? You boost enrichment loyalty. Customers will do more business with you than they otherwise would have. And advocacy loyalty. They'll say good things about you. They'll recommend you, not just to the world in general, but crucially, to people who are actually in the market for what you provide, which is the most important kind uh, of advocacy loyalty. So when you improve CX quality, you improve the three types of customer loyalty and you improve revenue. And we can actually prove it. I said I was gonna talk more about data. Now I'm gonna do that. Next slide, please. Because I'm making a pretty big claim here that CX drives three kinds of loyalty, which drives revenue growth. I want to say just a, just a word about where that data comes from. It comes from a data set we call the Customer Experience Index. And what it does is it combines those three E's. It's a survey of customers. It combines effectiveness, ease, and emotion, and the behaviors that they engender, retention loyalty, enrichment loyalty, advocacy loyalty, runs them through an algorithm, and comes out with a number between 0 and 100. And the higher that number, the better your company is at creating customer experiences that drive loyalty. And that's something in particular, because there are plenty of customer experiences out there that people like, but that they don't like in a way that drives loyalty. And driving loyalty is the whole point of this thing. And so that's what we want to get at here. So a we'll score between zero and 100 that shows how well your company delivers experiences that create and sustain loyalty. Next slide, please. 
So take a look at, at these numbers here. Remember that zero to 100 score. Even a one point improvement in your score has huge, massive revenue benefits. Our data shows if you're a mass market auto manufacturer, on average, you can get $1.1 billion in additional revenue per year with just a one point increase. It's the X index score. If you're a luxury auto manufacturer, on average, $45 million in additional uh, revenue. And I point this out because sometimes people say, okay, I, I get it. You know, if, if we get great at CX, you know, we'll get some additional customer loyalty. But, you know, we're not so good right now. And it's going to take us so long to get great at it. And it's going to be so much trouble. It's, it's too far in the future to think about. Well, I'm just talking about one tiny point here. One point improvement has huge benefits like this. You don't have to go from good to extraordinary. You just need to get a little better right? to, to see huge benefits to improving CX quality. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, <laughs> um, auto manufacturers aren't getting these, uh, uh, you know, the, the huge numbers of benefits that they could be getting from really improving CX quality. And to make my point, I'm going to show you uh, four charts. I'm going to show you uh, from the U.S. Uh, scores for mass market and luxury auto manufacturers. And then I'm going to show you the same two charts for Canada, mass market and luxury auto manufacturers. And what you're gonna find is that the story is pretty much the same all the way through. First of all, they're all mediocre. Remember that zero to 100 again we're looking at. They're all mediocre. They're all clustered pretty tightly together. So there's very little differentiation in the customer experience. And the scores are flat year over year. They're not really moving. So let's take a look at the first one, please. Uh, what we have here is mass market auto manufacturers in the U.S. Uh, the latest data we have there is 2019. Previous year is 2018. Uh, 2020 survey comes back shortly. So what you'll see here is that, you know, from Subaru up at the top to Dodge down at the bottom, we've got nine points or less of differentiation out of 100. And the average is, what, 72. 72, which is kind of, in, you know, in that, in that, that good, okay kind of, kind of range. It's, it's, it's a pretty bland customer experience. So, you know, we've got mediocrity, we've got clustering, which means no brand differentiation in terms of CX, and flat. You know, the only scores that actually have a real change year over year are the ones that down there uh, on the right that have an asterisk next to them. And you can see uh, there's very little, there's only a couple of them there that moved at all. So flatness is the order of the day. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Take a look at this again, you know, from Lexus at the top to BMW at the bottom. Again, this is U.S. data only. We've got less than nine points of differentiation out of 100. There's very little reason for a customer uh, to, to come to you because your experience is pretty much of the same quality, ease, effective emotion as everybody else's. Uh, plus, you know, that, that lack of differentiation is only around the 74 point range. Again, that, that sort of OK level. Um, and hardly any movement year over year. Uh, next one, please. Mass market auto manufacturers in Canada, same story. Flat, clustered, mediocre. We did see a little bump from GMC up there at the top, few points, good for them. All right, but very little movement um, uh, elsewhere throughout this. And uh, the fourth one, what do you know it's the same story? Even less differentiation here. 74 at the top to 67 at the bottom, very tightly clustered. A couple of them did move slightly, but it's, uh, uh, it's the same story over and over and over again. So what's going on here? Why do we see uh, so little movement and, and, and such uh, uh, clustering uh, from automotive uh, companies? Next slide, please. It, it, the big picture is this. Client expectations and CX improvement are occurring at the same slow pace. Here's what I mean. Sometimes people say customer expectations are skyrocketing and they're not. Our data shows they're not skyrocketing, but they are creeping upward. 
That's one tortoise. And a lot of automotive companies, well, every automotive company is trying to improve the quality of the customer experience, but they're not improving it very efficiently. They're doing a lot of CX stuff, but not focusing on the right CX stuff. And so most of their efforts are, are wasted and ineffectual. So that's the second tortoise. And so you've got the expectations tortoise and the CX improvement tortoise, as they're going at the same speed, which means that in effect, the quality of the experience remains flat. Next slide, please. But what this means is it's a huge opportunity for you. If you've got general mediocrity and undifferentiated clustering and flatness, that means the field is wide open for your company to leap into CX-based differentiation with just a few points of CX index growth, drive retention, enrichment, advocacy, and that is well within reach. Thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Rick. It's a fantastic uh, review of the importance of CX, and I think it really highlights, uh, next slide, please, where we are right now. We've experienced a, a somewhat of a crisis in, in, in the global system, and what we're seeing and, and our supposition is that leaning into CX issues like this can accelerate uh, your ability to capture market share when you take the initiative to improve that CX, even by one point, you can really make the difference between a slow, passive recovery and an aggressive, speedy recovery where you gain market share and you gain all of those loyalty and advocacy elements that you want to engender from your consumers and from your buying population. Um, so as, as a company, what Capgemini has done, next slide please, is we've created a recovery framework that has a number of uh, elements that we think all work together to help our customers uh, and clients meet the needs of this rapidly changing and evolving situation. For the purposes of our talk this morning, of course, we're going to focus in, next slide, on what we're calling uh, the contactless customer experience. So if there's, if you know, we've, we've got a whole new way of thinking about our customer experience, especially in the automotive sector, that really requires us to rethink what we're doing, how we're communicating with our buyers and how we're delivering that purchase experience and ownership experience too. So uh, next slide, please. We're very excited to have Julia with us the, uh, today, all the way from China. Hello, Julia. And uh, could you tell us just a bit about uh, your role at Cap Gemini, what you normally do, and then lead us into your fantastic slides? Hi, good morning, guys. I started in Beijing working for Cap Gemini, and I'm I'm normally the person in between tech and business. I'm I'm a psychologist originally, and um, I have a big passion for everything digital, which also will lead me to the point later of being in China. Chinese people and Chinese economy has a has a great um, affinity for everything digital. They just skip the computer age. Everybody has a smartphone. Nobody in the broader public is really used to web browsers. They just skip that and started doing everything with their mobiles. They pay per mobile. You pay your bills. You um, go to the grocery store with it and just scan QR codes to pay. We can also see that in the automotive sales. So what, what we're discussing in Germany, Europe and the US for years, that it's not so easy to sell cars in an online shop. They just do it. Um, the cool thing in China is they are not only having all those big OEMs and like the BMWs, Volkswagens, GMs, Fords of the world, but due to their um, electric vehicle policies, they have a lot of um, new journeys in the market, really tiny, but very digital um, small companies that are just agile enough to do things like that easily. And yeah, Rick, your tortoise uh, picture, we still have that here, but there are a lot of um, market participants that just um, make all this a little quicker. As I said, we have a little head start coming to Corona. 
um, in China for, yeah, I think six to eight weeks, we are getting back to normal. Um, sales figures for the first quarter are still horrible, but now in April we see that it's getting better, especially the premium um, manufacturers are doing really good. Also compared to like last year, April, they're doing even better. Um, so in this early um, early research, especially those um, in the severe outbreak regions, that was really different in China. So those coming from Wuhan, um, because they were just purely not even able to leave their houses, um, showed a natural high increase um, of their interest in an online car purchase. Um, what came with this was also that door-to-door -door test drive and car delivery. Um, Chinese industries made a really good job on that. So we were lack lacking nothing here. We had all our foods and all our groceries and everything delivered right to the doorstep. Somebody rang and when you opened, it was just there. And basically that, they also took to um, the idea of a non-contact or contactless um, test drives and car deliveries and it I think it took them three weeks until they had that figured out that was really quick So next slide, please. Oh also interesting um, In in the time of the lockdown and the the early time of coronavirus and still um, Chinese people didn't consider um, Public transport safe. There are still companies that pay their um, employees the DD so the Uber and the taxi rides in order to not have them go by bus or subway. Um, there are new reasons in China to buy a car. The one and most important that wasn't there before is that 77% of the people said that when I drive my own car, um, the chance of infections just are diminished. The one source people want to buy cars from is now the online showroom or the virtual forest shop. Everything is quite different now and it seems like there's a good chance to just stick to that and um, stick to the pace to um, really, really make it a little different than before. Yeah, those numbers seem pretty dramatic in terms of pre and post uh, event uh, digital usage. And, uh, and yeah, that's fantastic uh, a review, Julia. Thank you so much for helping us understand what's happening in China. And now to turn to the EU and Daniel Garshagen, can you help us understand what you're seeing happen in uh, the EU and in Germany specifically? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Julia. Happy to take over. Happy to give you an overview about what's happening uh, in Europe and to some extent in, in Germany um, in specific. Um, a few words to myself. I'm uh, leading our Applied Innovation Exchange in, in Munich and I'm also a part of our larger automotive digital team uh, focusing on marketing, sales and service. And um, looking at what, what's happening in, in Europe is, and that's have been always the case that um, Europe is not in the same pace as uh, as we see that happening in in APEC and specifically in China, but but nevertheless, um, COVID nineteen um, did influence also um, the perspectives in Europe, and uh, we see a fundamental shift um, with regards to consumption, with regards to investment decisions, and also with regards to let's say future mobility uh, behavior and. Um, we, we can see that based off on, of, on the research that we have conducted um, with a large number of uh, participants. And to outline a couple of those, I brought with me uh, some of the numbers uh, which I want to show you here. So um, one thing that we're seeing, and, and this is, uh, well, good and a, and a bad uh, sign for, for automotive companies is that 58% um, of consumers are postponing their planned car purchase. Um, the good thing is they are not cancelling it. The bad thing, obviously, is that they are postponing it. And they are doing that because of their own individual uh, financial uncertainty. Um, that's something that needs to be considered. And, and with regards to customer experience, um, that, that means nothing less than you got to be ready uh, once those customers are ready to make the purchase. Um, 
looking at, at the uh, other topic here is that 89% uh, of undecided consumers um, could then be pursued um, to buy based on an attractive offer or on, uh, based on a positive customer experience. So this is along with what I was saying before, um, that if you are providing a great customer experience, customers um, who are willing to buy than a vehicle are more likely to do that. Um, and a great customer experience can be offline at the retail store, but then we come to that later, can be most likely be online as well. Um, and this is what brings me to my next point. 60% of consumers are saying that they are now more likely to buy a vehicle online. Um, now means um, more likely than before the pandemic. And, and this is very interesting to see because we all know that um, buying a car online um, is not as buying a, a book online. And we, we're seeing OEMs, we're seeing national sales companies uh, running their pilots uh, running their, their, their first um, solutions for, for online sales. But on the other hand side, we are also seeing that customers um, not yet are dig into it. They're not yet utilizing it. Um, but it seems there's customers are now really looking forward to buy their vehicles online. And obviously that means that there's a lot to do for OEMs, for national sales companies, for retail groups to offer the right customer experience to those customers online. Because as I was saying, it's not like buying a book. Um, and that again goes along with the 56% of consumers who prefer a car with more flexible payment options. Um, and why is it related to buying a car online? Buying a car online is also uh, is meaning that you will have to spend a large amount of money online. And if you are able to have more flexible payment options, then you are more willing to spend that money online. And more flexible payment options means, uh, for example, subscription models um, where you are um, it's, it's not like leasing. Leasing is for longer term. Leasing is typically 24, 36 months. Um, having a subscription model means basically you are subscribing to a vehicle to be used for, let's say, three months period. And then you can flip your vehicle or you can maybe even um, cancel your, your contract. And um, this package of subscription is then the vehicle as, as such. It's um, including servers, um, including mileage, not including fuel in most cases. Um, but this is uh, definitely something where OEMs need to think about. We're seeing first OEMs doing that, um, not only in Europe, but also in other markets, uh, but definitely something which is interesting. Interesting also because we see that almost 44% uh, of consumers are planning to increase their private car usage after the pandemic. This is good news for OEMs. Um, so we see that um, those consumers are more willing to drive their own vehicle and interesting and we have heard that in the beginning is that we have we are seeing even the younger generation uh, looking for for individual mobility more than before and um, this then again um, is in, in correlation to the more flexible payment options and the subscription models because younger generations they want to now want to have their own uh, vehicle but on the other hand side um, that generation um, might not have the buying power as the older generation. So these flexible payment options um, give them a, a chance to um, get their own vehicle. Mm, so those are some numbers. Um, now I want to show you a couple, at least in this case, two examples, what already has happened in Europe. Uh, first example is with uh, FCA, so Fiat Chrysler. What they have done is they've launched a virtual dealer program. Topic was that obviously people were not allowed to go to the retailer because of lockdown and they weren't able to get connected to the retailer. They might not, might not even knew um, who the retailer was, who to, whom to contact. And this is why FCA launched the virtual dealer program where customers online uh, on the FCA homepage can send their request for information, request for, for um, a virtual meeting. Um, and then um, the, the central team, the call center team uh, from FCA would connect that request to the respective dealer. And then the dealer would engage um, to the prospect to um, answer questions, to do some video um, calls, some uh, screen sharing. 
um, in order to together and jointly configure vehicle and then even make a quote. Um, that's not online sales yet, but it's um, on the way towards it. Second example from Audi, basically something similar because it's not yet really online sales, but it's on, on, the, on, the, on the way towards that. Um, they have launched their online reservation program. Um, and what's happened here is um, they have simplified basically the e-commerce process by adding this feature. So um, when customers, they can search online for a specific vehicle. And uh, when they have configured it and if when they are, uh, are let's say, likely to buy that vehicle, uh, they can make a reservation for that vehicle and the dealer, the respective dealer who is connected to that opportunity, will then contact the customer uh, to discuss some uh, finance details and other related topics. Um, it will be reserved, including the price, by the way, for seven days. And based on that, the customer then can, can purchase the vehicle. So what we see here is we have the connection between online world and the offline world where the retailer gets in touch with the customers. And, and one thing to add here, uh, that solution uh, went go live in uh, just four weeks um, to be mentioned here by, by our support. And um, that was really great to see um, that this company, in that case Audi, really reacted fast to the changing situation and um, brought that law live in only four weeks. So what do we learn from that? Um, we've heard before from from Rick the race of the tortoises and and in, in Europe I, I would definitely say it, it was the just the way it's as uh, described by Rick and what we see now is that COVID-19 is bringing the new normal um, much closer than expected um, the new normal um, described from basically from from OEMs maybe in the past was okay we will have at some day online sales we will have subscription models in a couple of months or even years. Um, but in that case, we're seeing that we need to have that now. And so from, from having the race of the tortoises um, from both sides, customers and OEMs, um, we have now the new normal already been there or being there in a couple of weeks. And um, OEMs need to react now to um, reflect those changing customer demands. Um, consequently, OEMs need to, and they are already pushing those in, uh, those initiatives. Um, examples we have seen before, and maybe on a broader scale, what kind of examples do we see here? So those are these new business models, so subscription models, digital services, and new sales models, such as e-commerce and, and direct sales. So it's a lot about contactless customer experience, but it's also about um, new business models, new sales models that need to be um, brought to the customer in order to reach the customer in the new normal. Um, that's your perspective from, from Europe. Great, Daniel. Thank you very much. That's fascinating. And it seems like all of these things need to move in concert to be able to deliver that customer experience that these new uh, business models are going to require. So it's fantastic to hear uh, how that's progressing in the European Union. Now we're going to look to Mike Dart to tell us about North America. Awesome. Um, happy to do so. Um, so let's go ahead and, uh, for the interest of time, um, shift, to, uh, shift to the actual slides. I don't need to look at a picture of me. Uh, so I think um, it's no surprise that um, COVID has had far reaching impacts, um, hit every industry, um, every aspect of, of the world, of our society. So, um, you know, with our focus today being on automotive and on the customer experience, we just wanted to set the stage a little bit by, by recognizing, uh, man, um, there have been impacts far and wide. Um, we've listed some here uh, that have hit automotive manufacturers, um, including global production stops and supply chain disruptions, um, other impacts to um, their sales channels. Um, we've had impacts on the on the dealer side uh, with depending on your region of the of the globe, um, whether those dealers were considered essential services. Um, some of them were uh, completely closed um, and you are unable to uh, as a consumer to access um, the, um, those dealers um, at a minimum you might be able to access the, the service 
uh, a part of the business, but even they may be experiencing some challenge with um, part availability, um, access to the technicians in order to service the vehicles, um, and uh, and everything that would support that part of the business. Um, but all the way down to consumers, you're looking at things around financial uncertainty, reduced purchasing power. Um, have have you as a consumer been personally impacted um, by this? And chances are the answer to that is yes. Um, are you are you looking to postpone any other major investments? Um, and uh, you you're probably looking very much at your patterns of mobility usage. Um, did you did you fly for work? Did you ride public transportation? Did you use rideshare um, in various capacities? So um, and what's not even shown on here are the are the farther reaching impacts uh, within the, the overall value chain. We're considering impacts on supplier side, uh, availability of raw material or of the the employees and the resources. Are they able to um, go back to work yet um, for distributors, um, for you know players in the supply chain and logistics space. Um, so it really has touched every aspect of, uh, of of the industry. But if if you just click down one time, um, there are some bright lights. Um, and uh, actually, if you would um, three more times. There we go. One more time, and finally one more. So I wanted to go through all those quickly because there are these bright lights. So on the OE side, um, we are seeing some of those first signs of recovery. Um, you know, we heard from uh, from a global aspect, we heard from China, we've heard from Europe. Um, I'm speaking from a North America. That's really the direction that this the impact has hit us and that the recovery is playing out. Um, so we're seeing, seeing uh, those, those first signs of recovery in a global aspect. Um, for dealers, um, we're seeing that consumers are more and more um, trending toward um, increasing their online traffic. Um, so if you're in China, whether that's on your mobile device um, or if you're in other parts of, of the, the Western world that you're online or perhaps on your mobile, um, if you are beginning to consider being in market, chances are you are going online first in order to do that. So those players, um, be they the OEs um, or their, even their dealers um, who how, are recognizing this are attracting um, those, those consumers. So here's where the consumer experience um, is really coming into the forefront. Uh, and just like we heard from, from Rick, um, that's playing an even bigger role in the, what, what experience that you um, may be providing for your consumers um, is is really forefront um, in that. Uh, and then, you know, in the, on the consumer space, we're seeing a massive uptick in the online um, shopping. So the more that you're able to do online in order to support that overall end-to-end -end consumer experience, um, the the better off you're going to be in in your chance to to win that that consumer. So this new normal that we're seeing really is end-to-end -end digital engagement. And you have some of the new players, the disruptors, if you will, um, in the industries, the Teslas of the world that were already set up for this because they had a largely online experience from end-to-end. -end. We're also seeing others that were more of the traditional players quickly accelerate. Um, and uh, and just like uh, Daniel talked about that, that, that core, they're advancing that core more quickly than they had um, before. So if we go to the next slide and just see a, an example of, of where this is working really well. Um, if we look at, at Hyundai here in, in North America, uh, they did something that um, personally I think was a very clever use of, of resources um, and also a great way to really um, engage their consumers in a live way. Um, so uh, many of the automakers, all the automakers have a presence that in, in the auto shows uh, on a global basis. Well, there weren't any auto shows um, that those were those were postponed or or canceled um, due to the global pandemic. So you've got these product experts um, that you normally have on stage speaking about the cars. What better way to um, to leverage the strengths and and their expertise and to really engage your consumers well in an online fashion than to set up um, live demos um, and these are chat sessions there's a there's a product expert that's reviewing a vehicle in a live fashion and can answer questions um, from from you as a consumer um, as you enter them and and engage you by name and answer those questions um, and you know I, I joined one of these sessions just to explore uh, and I was came away so impressed by 
how well this played out because as I was asking various questions about the product uh, and just to see how how well this this process would play out another actual um, Hyundai consumer um, wrote in on this chat session with a question that was in regards to her lease ending but because she was based in New York her local dealerships were closed so she had questions about what she needed to do in order to um, engage and either renew her lease or um, acquire a new lease on another Hyundai the product specialist was able to answer those questions immediately and effectively um, and to point her to the right resources in order to get that done through um, through the Hyundai uh, financial organization um, and that customer came away informed pleased and um, probably likely to either renew that lease or to you know, do another lease on a Hyundai vehicle so really clever use of, uh, of, of engagement of live consumer experience um, and doing so in such a way that that endears um, the the brand to the customer um, and and drives a level of loyalty over and above perhaps what they may have been um, experiencing before. So if we think of of Rick's chart um, earlier in the presentation and and where where those those brands begin to play out in the the degree of of positive customer experience. Um, you know, Rick, I don't know how this one plays into, um, you know, the, the Hyundai's ranking, but uh, I'd be interested to see the next time we take a look at, at that and where they, where, they, uh, where they end up and whether that is, has, uh, has taken them up the ladder a bit. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so what we're talking about is, at a high level, is the end-to-end -end customer journey. And, um, you know, there are so many aspects of this, whether it goes from awareness, consideration, transaction and sales, ownership and usage, service and expansion. That circle of life, if you will, um, is one that is playing out daily. It's playing out in every way that we engage um, from, a, from a consumer, whether it's in the automotive space or whether it is in other aspects, other products, it still plays out. Um, so the degree and how well you can engage in that is, is what we're really um, talking about um, today. So let's go, to the, let's go to the next slide. Um, and, and what you'll see here is that there are, there are many aspects of this, and each one of those, if we lay out that circle of life um, into a linear fashion here, um, but th th there are things that, that are, are key and that are going to be um, not just table stakes um, you know, the, of the past, but certainly foundational for the, a positive customer experience and, and uh, what consumers will grow to expect in an, in an economy that has, through the COVID crisis, um, really embraced online and, and mobile engagement in even a higher degree. Um, so that is you know, things like, I struggle a little bit with this word, but findability. So, um, how how easy are you to find um, on your products? How are you, easy are they to find? Are they are they very searchable? What channels are you are you are you leveraging? If we consider the next one on product and service positioning, um, you know what is the overall product experience? Um, are you transitioning to a, a model where there are contact contactless test drives? Um, we're seeing this in in China um, and uh, and really um, into into Europe and in the United States with some of the um, the more advanced and, and forward thinking players um, providing ways to arm customers or enable customers um, to have a contactless test drive. So perhaps they deliver the vehicle to you, it's wiped down for um, cleanliness, and um, then you know you have you have an experience that overall um, enables you to have that very positive experience to get you through the, old, the overall um, uh, purchase experience. So there's there's a lot of content to go through here. I won't drain this slide, um, and uh, but but know that every bit of this and every bit of your customer journey in this new customer experience um, is is there's a degree of expectation. Um, that consumers are going to have um, that you do this in a very in a very well um, uh, executed manner so let's go to the next one and let's talk about okay well there's some numbers associated with this so if we're talking about how you recover and, and reestablish the core of your sales business implementing these new measures and integrating you know even new new businesses and operating models that um, you know perhaps you had considered in the past this is a way to, to use those as accelerators. So <clears throat> also, 
a, a, in a way that engages your consumer. <clears throat> Pardon me. So we heard um, Daniel Davenport speak at the uh, early on about the global survey, and and what we recognized in that is that people were interested in um, in um, personal mobility. Um, they were interested in the hygiene associated with that, that they were um, younger, they were trending younger than they had in the past, and that even though um, they they may be more concerned about their finances, they're that much more likely to, to engage and to purchase if there are offers that are, are tailored um, even more closely to them. So that's what we're seeing play out in this, whether it's in the special offers and the lift that you could see um, through that, through flex flexible contracts. Um, so new ways and, uh, and uh, uh, new, new uh, buying options for those consumers, buying, leasing um, finance options, and then more and more um, leaning towards um, completing as much of that transaction as possible online. Um, so the digital sales aspect of, of that is is huge. Um, so that's um, great. Thank you Mike. very thank much. You so much um, for, and yeah, I'll hand it back to Daniel Davenport. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, for giving us that perspective. And Rick, as you hear this, uh, these these people from around the world talking about uh, in market activities, and especially considering the younger populations, what do you think about the role of CX in this next short term uh, recovery phase? Yeah, it's it's an incredible story to hear, and as I'm hearing folks talk, it's like it's like there's a new automotive revolution happening. You know, uh, with, with uh, yeah. people, you know, people who weren't considering buying a car before, considering it now, and considering doing it in new ways. And one of the one of the things that that uh, is so interesting for me to 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 hear about is the ways that um, that OEMs are uh, pivoting so quickly on this. You, you know, right. there, there, there's there's a lot of times when you know, especially large manufacturers and stuff are are you know, aren't considered the most uh, um, uh, adaptable you know, companies in in the world, but but you know the the so many of these OEMs are really um, uh, I think are really changing their reputation. You know these are these are huge companies. They um they're they're not traditionally digital, and the products and services that they provide are are physical objects. You know that have to be manufactured and and uh, built and shipped to different places. And yet we're seeing these shifts in just a few weeks, um, you know, amazing shifts in, in, in the customer experience and not just in improving an individual channel. Oh, you know, we already had a website, we made it a little bit better. Oh, we already answered your emails, but now we answer them a little faster. But really, it, really inventing entirely new experiences um, uh, from scratch that, you know, three months ago, nobody was imagining. And, and you know, so to me, that's, that's a really good news, you know, that 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 very large, very traditional companies are able to make pivots like that so quickly and thinking strategically about them rather than just panicking and doing a lot of, as I said earlier, CX stuff, most of which isn't going to stick. It sounds to me like they're really focusing on things that um, uh, that are really going to stick around and improve the quality of the customer experience in, in really measurable ways. So I'm optimistic. Yeah, I think that, that what we're seeing is a is a great acceleration of some trends that were already underway, but but that are going to stay with us well after, uh, you know, this event kind of subsides. And I think that the the focus on the the experience of these new events is going to be critical uh, for the people, as you said in in earlier in your slides, to differentiate because everybody's clustered right there together. So the Hyundai's doing things, online streaming, uh, the, the applications in China and the new business models in Germany are really going to open up that, I would imagine, that race to get to the consumer. Uh, and we're going to see some differentiation happen and some people that break out of the pack with better customer experiences and maybe even better employee experiences to go along with that. Well, fantastic. Thank you all so much for your time today. We really appreciate everyone's participation. Uh, for our audience members, we hope that you guys uh, got something to take away and apply in your day-to-day -day work uh, in, in the automotive sector. We're going to have a link to the research uh, accompanying this, and we'll uh, provide some slides as well. We welcome 
follow-up questions and and we thank our friends at Forrester and in particular Rick Parrish for his participation this morning. Thank you all everyone and have a great day.